Hi, everybody. Dennis Black here for Black and Wyatt Records. Welcome to the Black and Wyatt Records podcast. Join us today as artist and filmmaker Mike McCarthy interviews Black and Wyatt recording artist and Opossum's band member Jesse Mansfield as he shares his unique perspective on rock and roll history and other fascinating topics. Now, here's Mike McCarthy. So many are knowledgeable, and, and for those who don't know, you master uh, all the Black and Wyatt um, bands uh, to vinyl, so you're the guy that does all that. So you have an interest in vinyl from a bootleg perspective, from an archival perspective, from a fidelity perspective. Man- manufacturing everything, pretty much. Manu- yeah. Well, yeah, because we, you and I met at Memphis Record Pressing yeah. when we worked there. We we made the records and found out all the dirty secrets and practices. And I I left, not my thing. No, it was turns great. out was I great. I'm not a factory man. Turns out right. I'm not cut out for it. Yeah. But uh, what's what is mastering? It's a good question. I <laughs> almost don't know how to answer, even though I went to school for this you, stuff. You mastered your beer. Um. Well, I mean, this kind of gets into the world of vinyl and history of medium and stuff like that uh mm-hmm. it's supposed to just be tying up all of the tracks into a cohesive final product you know you kind of even out the volume if they're coming from different places make sure they all sound relatively the same if that's what you're going for you well, don't, you don't ton- have it's you don't tonal have control yeah, yeah, yeah you don't have to do all that if you're trying to you know make it be a little experimental or or purposefully sound uneven, but generally it's when people kind of wrap it everything up together to make it a cohesive final product. And that involves volume, EQ, compression, uh, even just like the sequencing, where do the tracks go, you know, in the track listing, what else? You might change the track listing if, the band, if yeah, the band could be convinced of it. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's been times where <clears throat> stuff got botched in the mastering stages. And it also involves actually like cutting a record, you know, like preparing it to, you know, op- optimizing it to sound good on vinyl, to sound good on tape, sound good on Spotify. Because mm-hmm. you have to tweak little things about it to make it sound good for those different formats. Right. Small things. Um and a lot of that, I think, is like lost art kind of stuff that people used to know how to, you know, pump them out by the zillions. But now it's like most people don't know anything about mastering, including me. And uh, I mean, I, I can I can do it well enough, but I, I would never consider myself to be a, a mastering master. Well, it's you, a, you, it's, you it's do a, a good job for Black and White, I think. Good, good mastering is a slightly mysterious art form. Especially mastering for vinyl and actually cutting, because a lot of those guys aren't around anymore, and the equipment is almost not there either. You mean like cutting on a lathe? Or, yeah, yeah. Because you know? I mean, uh, even just like lathes, uh, the actual blanks, the main plant that was producing them burned down a few years ago in California, and that I think they accounted for ninety percent of lathe like lacquer production in the world. Mm-hmm. And now there's one place left, and it's this small operation in Japan. And but I, from what I've been told, all the guys who cut on lacquers, which is mostly in the U.S., uh, they've all stockpiled, and I think they're all okay for a while. Okay. But like the the <clears throat> place in the Czech Republic that all right. we worked with, they pump them out by the zillions, and they do metal cutting, so they don't need lacquers. They just cut straight to the metal. Now what, and what that, is, that's that's something that's been around since the 80s. But you frown on that? No, I mean mm-hmm. it still sounds fine. It's, yeah. it's you wouldn't know the difference if you, somebody did it in a blind test. It's supposed to be a little bit better actually, but cutting houses in the world now are direct metal. I think most of the lacquer ones that are left are all in the U.S. and sort of a vice versa. There's not that many metal cutting lathes in the United States. There are a few that I have read were bought in an auction by the Church of Scientology, and they are in a cave somewhere in the Southwest, and they use it to cut L. Ron Hubbard's speeches and instructionals 
two discs for preservation and safekeeping, and I'm not making any of that well, up. My next question was, do you research. believe in aliens? Uh, oh, I think, yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm, I'm not like a big researcher or anything, mm. but I think it'd be, I, I think it's kind of a s- stupid concept to think that we're the only people around. I don't know, basic. I'm a basic alien believer. Where do you where do you get your information from? Oh, the internet. <laughs> Mississippi? No, little, little of it at this point. Um, well, wait. What you, went to, you went to school in Mississippi? Several times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for my whole life. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's um, okay. It's, no, you're it's from fine. Hattiesburg. Yes. But you went to school in Hattiesburg to learn audio engineering. No, Cleveland, Mississippi, to, ah, to learn oh, audio. Oh, the Grammy Museum School. That, or Delta, Delta State. Oh, well, yeah. The funny thing about that is when I went for the school visit the first time, that was the day they were announcing that they were building a Grammy Museum. That was going to be the only one other than the one in L.A. Hmm. And they picked Cleveland over like Memphis, Nashville, Atlanta, Chicago, or something like that because it's in the birthplace of the blues. And they wanted it to be in a neat location well, to draw tourists. Are you still in the opossums? Yes. So the opossums still play? Yeah, we've been. it's been... I'm trying to remember when the first record came out. I feel like it was 20... 18 maybe black and white it, record it feels like it's mm-hmm. been a, a minute so um, who's the lineup oh well, it's the three of us as usual me and patrick jordan and Liv hernandez and then in the past year or so we brought in our friend tyler harrington to play bass and i've moved over to guitar mm-hmm. so that we can rock one louder mm-hmm. and one harder mm-hmm. and i can do some jangly things on a, a fake Rickenbacker 12 string okay and not have to worry about being minimal anymore minimal we're still trying to be minimal and you know keep mm-hmm. it together but and, and at, you record at your house or I used to record at my my last house now we kind of do it wherever we can yeah and I, I can usually make whatever situation work sure so you engineer you re- you you have the equipment to record then you might turn around and master the recording you're doing everything. Yeah, I, I sort of hack master. I don't. I'm not like a, a mastering wizard, but mm-hmm. I know how to make it palatable enough. I I, <clears throat> I dabble in a little bit of everything. I, right. I'm always trying to find new things to get into. I'm finally getting into Bruce Springsteen at age 31. I well, thought I thought it was. This get, might be I a good thought, time to take a commercial break. I thought it was going to take until about 46 or so, but I, yeah. it, something about it finally clicked, and now I'm all in. All right. So you have this interest in in music but when does it become an interest in in recording and then what really snags you as far as the the all the subtleties that you've you've already talked about all these things that require a great deal of um, subtlety and just access really i mean a lot of that goes all together for me because a lot of the stuff that i like i like because of the way it sounds mostly Mm -hmm. i'm i'm not entirely literate Uh, i'm not great with like lyrical interpretation and stuff but i like the way things sound right Be- even just beyond the music that's being played uh do you do you try you to know. get into the head of the people that are making the sound that you like so much like I, imagine, oh yeah i mean um, like late 60s to be high in california in the late 60s as you're being a rock star with hair of an, some length and a beard probably and you know and god knows what cocktail of chemicals you're on and the next thing you know you've released smiley smile and 40, well, those guys, 50 years later, someone like you loves it because of some myriad of reasons that, because it's challenging, you're not supposed to like it. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I I think it's funny with them because those dudes were, no matter how hard they tried, they were squares at the end of the day. Like, you know, <laughs> the Beach Boys the, are squares. The, their, their parents raised them to be squares, right. and I, I, that's part of their existence is trying to get out from under Murray's wing. Right. Overly protective and abusive wing, and that's you know that's part of what makes the band. It's a classic American tale, you know. <laughs> abusive what? father beats his kids into shape to try to make them successful. Sometimes I like when it sounds technically bad. Well, what's your because it's got charm. Sure. I mean, Who are you coming to see in Memphis that would make you drive that far? Oh, there were a bunch of metal bands and oh the all the big garage bands at the time that Goner was bringing through town, and uh. And then I moved up here, and it looks like a lot of that stopped. I think a couple. I think a couple of the booking people that were the guys that were really bringing that stuff to town all moved off or something. But what year did you move here? I moved here in twenty 
15, summer mm-hmm. 2015. So I've been here almost mm-hmm. 10 years now. Mm-hmm. It's been good. Um, I guess you can't really say there's never anything going on because that's not true at all. It's not like New York bad where you have too many options and no money. Mm-hmm. It, you can you can kind of pick and choose here, and I like that. You can stay home and be okay and not feel like you're missing out. But there's always plenty of stuff to go do if you want to. Um, and I, I've been trying to find more people to know, I guess. Really? Not in an entrepreneurial spirit, but yeah. more than just a what's the point of all this if you're not making friends and playing loud, dumb music right. along the way and trading records with them and pitching recording and well let's let's hear a record wor- working on four track stuff sure and we can talk about all that too let's let's pop something in here what you want to play a song by the opossums sure that's a that's a four track song i sent it's a demo version that i did on a four track <laughs> That was the Opossums, Jesse Mansfield's band, Memphis band. What was the name of that tune? Medicine. Medicine. Okay, so we were you were talking about it while it was playing. Tell me, give me background on the re- recording philosophy. That's a demo version. We did it on a four-track Yamaha cassette deck. <laughs> Just one track drums, one track guitar, one track bass, one track vocals, and loop the vocals through an Echoplex tape delay. And then basic mix it and then mix it down to a quarter inch tape reel to reel and then just dump that onto the computer how much time did that take uh i don't know maybe two hours or so just (laughs) most like two days it's a short song so it's mostly just a lot of patching and repatching of cables right and zooming it back and trying to get levels and all that kind of stuff right the tedious part um and then where was it recorded Oh, that was at my old house. That was a couple of years ago. We um, re- we re-recorded okay. that song for the last album we put out on eight track, fuller sound, some overdubs and all that kind of stuff. But I That's... did I did that song and another song as demo versions on the four track cassette, and I had a I have this mini record cutter. That's like a toy record cutter from Japan, mm-hmm. and it cuts these little plastic three inch records. It's like a lathe cutter, and I, I made five or six of them. And gave them out at Possum's shows. So, it's so like, that's a secret demo. It's Yeah, it's a secret demo. Um, I, actually, it, maybe it's not secret. I think it's on our Bandcamp page, but it's more of a novelty, I guess. Well, speaking of novelties, how do you go about making the 8-tracks? I've bought 8-tracks from you. and uh... Oh, that's a huge mistake uh, <laughs> to get into those. I, I just, I've always had 8-tracks next to the records and cassettes and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I I made it a COVID project to actually go through them and refurbish them and change, erase them. Ch- no, change out the pressure pads, 
make sure they're spooled correctly and moving because it's it's a figure eight infinity loop of a tape and you have to make sure everything is spliced correctly wait so you're saying that you went into your eight track collection and saved it i fixed all the good ones yeah but you used the bad ones to record opossums yes and i used bad ones with my recordable deck to make some possums eight tracks so when i'm listening to an opossums eight track yeah they work i'm listening to what captain and tenille's <laughs> muskrat love underneath uh, oh don't say that slight, in front of dennis slightly erased underneath see it all circles back to the beach boys because captain was named by brian what do you mean brian's the one brian wilson is the one who gave him the nickname the captain explain there's three it's not tenille what am i trying to say captain Dragon. It's Dennis. Huh? It's Daryl Dragon. Daryl Dragon. Daryl Dragon. What a weird name. He was sort of uh, Dennis's partner in his early songwriting. That's some weird and wild stuff. It, around 69, 70, 71, too. And uh, Daryl was in the Beach Boys band in the early 70s for a while. Nobody and, ever and to- talks about to- that. Tony, Tony Tennille was a background singer. What? During that time, too, off and on. Captain um, and Tennille were in the Beach Boys. Mm-hmm. At the same time. Yeah, around like 71 and 2. 70, 71, 72. And Dennis, did you know that? Captain is that. Captain's all over Sunflower. He plays on that record a bunch. Uh, he had two brothers. There's Daryl, Dennis, and Darth Vader Dragon. I can't remember. So they're the, I can't like the, the third. antimatter it's, it's, version it's, of the Beach Boys. It's another, yeah, it's another <laughs> D. And they were all, their dad was like a studio owner or producer or something. And really? they've got some... In my weird record collecting times, I have found online they the Dragon Brothers made some albums in the late '60s that are all private pressed in very small numbers, and it's like experimental studio prog sort of <laughs> prog. Uh, there, you said it. Uh, Look, mark the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it <laughs> sort of overindulgence in the studio because they had limited time to mess around. So you would erase a Blackfoot eight track, but you wouldn't erase a Steely Dan eight track. No, oh. no, 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 no. no. No, no, no. Why not? I love Steely Dan. Well, I mean, everybody loves Steely Dan. No, right? they, no, they don't. No, no, you no, think, no Well, no. we think they no, do. No, because they're also a bunch of squares, but I think they're great. They're fantastic. Why are you? Why do you think? That? I don't know. Just because it's. I, I, like I said earlier. I'm not I'm, disagreeing with you. I'm like horrendous with lyrical interpretation, and those guys have the most cryptic, inane, insane sort of beat poet rambling nonsensical. Right stuff, and every time anybody's ever tried to ask them about it, they just give the, well, you know, it's about a diner in the sky, and that's all we can say about it. And it's <laughs> sort of responses. Well, so what if Nikki well, did that, lose that, the number? I that's, mean, what, that's what, right, what? Donald. You know, it, they're they're both in on the joke. Mm-hmm. They have this telepathic connection, and they those guys were messing around. You know? Well, I, I they, they also in yeah. the course of their later albums, and I mean even the earlier ones, managed to collect all of the best studio musicians of the 70s like skunk baxter well skunk was actually part of the band in the early 70s but he's also a great guitarist and now now he's on like the missile defense board or something really yeah yeah he he has his finger on the trigger at all times for the united states of america a guy named skunk yeah i mean i i mostly record on tape machines when i have the time um, if, if, if it's COVID lockdown time and we really got to do it, we're going to go straight through the digital boxes and stuff. And it's no fun for me. But I'm just saying, if you record but, on analog, that's what you're stuck with. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of why I like it. Cause I mean, I, I record on four track cassette. I do two track, eight track, uh, like reel to reel. Um, and I mean, I have some old like mono reel to reel players from the fifties that I'll do some stuff on every now and then, you know, like home recording. Mm-hmm real players that you would maybe have your phone hooked up to or whatever for an answering machine. Is that how we would get interesting vocal effects or things like that? You can, yeah. No. I mean, you, it, it, I mean, all that stuff, it's, it's a box and it's got tubes or transistors in it and there's an in and there's an out and they have varying levels of being able to fry or uh, alter a signal going through it. Some, so can I ask you this? Some, if you crank them, they, you know, it'll toast them pretty good in a, in a neat, aesthetically pleasing way if you're into weird lo-fi sort of ness tell me about your uh, your your band big clown because that's the song we want to play next big clown is my prog rock band um we're so progressive your prog rock band we're so progressive that all of our songs are like a minute and a half long or a minute long see i don't think a pro- i think a prog rock is being five and a half I, yeah i know we're so progressive that we've s- moved beyond the long wow. song structure and we're now a short form band. Damn. Um, what are we hearing? 
uh, I think Frogman. <laughs> it, it, Frog it takes Man. longer to say it than it does to play it. Frogman's been a fun one. It, it, we killed him recently, though, so we, we don't really do the Frogman fiasco anymore. It's got a whole tale to it. and Okay, we'll hear, let's you, hear the tale when should, we come you back. You should hear it. Okay. story is we played in milwaukee and the, there was a guy who said he was sore from doing the frogman too much and of course you want to know what the frogman is and it's this horrendous dance where you like crouch down and you put your hands behind the back of your legs like that mm-hmm. and then you hop around and it's like murder on your knees and mm-hmm. your calves and all that mm. and so on the way back we decided okay it's time to write our like cramps like instructional 60s mm. groovy dance song mm. and it's going to be about doing the frog man and it's not going to be extremely specific but Lu- Lu- when we'd play it at shows we'd get to the end and lucy would who's a teacher our singer lucy kaplan would instruct everybody before the song on how to do the dance and then <laughs> there's one minute in which you have to get ready to do the dance and then if you get to the end where it's time to hop and Lucy would be yelling and like a like a mean teacher at all these adults and well, she, <laughs> tell people they have to hop or she's going to beat them up and stuff. And so there's this room full of adults in their early 30s and late 20s all hopping around the ground like a bunch of idiots. And oh I'm, I'm just waiting for her to be done so the band can come back in. And it was always fun. But we, we played it out <laughs> enough times that we had to kill off the frogman. So now... We don't make it anybody do it. We just play it. But, well, it sounds like a horror show, but if you have to give everyone instruction... I mean, then... I, I like embarrassing people, sure. and it was always fun to just watch a bunch of people in a small room hopping around on the ground. When I'm saying if you sink two minutes into instruction, then the song itself can only be about a minute and a half. Yeah, that's the best part. Yeah. All right. Well, so where did that come out? Where can people find that song? That is... I mean, that's, all that stuff is on streaming, and we put out a 7-inch last year that's got the whole... 10 minute album on it a big full clown. length lp 10 minutes on a seven inch you self-released it uh no no our friend john in, in uh, buffalo has a label called swimming faith and he loves us and we love him and he put mm. out a s- small run of seven inches and we are almost sold out of them i think we have 15 or 20 left let's talk about I late think. night cardigan that's the jangle band the, none i of have those, not seen those, late are, night cardigan. those are not my songs um you did not write those. No, my uh, it's actually the three boys who were in Big Clown: myself and Steve Turner and Zach Mitchell. It's the three of us, mm-hmm. and we have a different lady at the helm, Casey Russell. Oh wow! And that is the friendly band, and all, that is all sort of indie pop music. Um, Melodious. S- yes, uh, Casey's a, a fantastic, amazing singer, and those are all Steve and Casey's songs, and. Okay. We all work on the arrangements together, and we're we're an indie pop band, but we are also loud and aggressive and unforgiving. Well, so, I like the so, way. So I like by the default, way you can, we are yeah. now a noise pop band. But you're in three bands now. Something like that. So I'm beginning to think if you really want to be a true 21st century Memphis musician, the the at the, least three. You got to be in three. Most people are in more than that if they if four to if, five if they like playing music. Yeah, the, if that's what they're. I'm, doing. I'm I'm maybe in more like four to five. All right, well let's play that real quick. We're going to play late night cardigan. <laughs>
Okay, so that was Happy Truman by Late Night Cardigan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. So what else did you bring? Um, Badfinger? The Badfinger song. Why? It, I kind of just threw that in there. I don't know. I've been listening to them a lot lately. Why? Um, because I'm, as much as I'm into insane, ridiculous, blown out, uh, not public friendly music of the punk and metal variety, I'm also into pop music and i'm always trying to find more old pop stuff that i like and the more you dig in the more you realize we are definitely past the golden age of just like general radio pop music well why do you define pop you're talking about 20th century 50s 60s pop music well we've got a a a nice incredibly healthy history of original bubblegum pop music right here in memphis tennessee oh like, like power pop stuff sure i don't really like the term power pop but i mean that's what most people would call it yeah, because I mean we've obviously got Big Star, but then there's like Van Duren. I'm trying to think of the other ones from like the late seventies from here. There's more. You mean like the, like the hot, raspberry? Hot, all the, I'm thinking raspberry. like the Memphis ones. There's like the yeah. hot dogs, and there's the Scruffs. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of them from here. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Right. So you're you're interested in that because you're living here. You're living soaking in the molecules of it oh yeah 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 Yeah. i'm i'm a newer memphian so i'm trying to learn as much as i can but would you want to play in a band like that i do it's called possums that's a a large large part of what possums is is i mean patrick's a total electric light orchestra bad finger power pop sort of well wizard we didn't even really talk about bad finger but that's okay Some people weren't about it at all because so, because they uh, thought it was cutting into their revenue streams. You're talking about stuff that you knew already or that's fascinated you? Or I mean, you- I knew some of it, but I, I'm reading this book from the mid-90s uh, called Bootleg, The Secret History of the Other Recording Industry by Clinton Halen. Mm-hmm. That's been really neat because it 
kind of takes it from vinyl through cassette through CD eras. And I am young enough to have grown up pretty much in, with internet at my disposal mm. my whole life. And which means I have had LimeWire and, you know, illegal downloading at my disposal my whole life as well, you know. And really? but, but at this point, it's like there's no need to do any of that because you can just pay a tiny amount to stream stuff. And it's like, you know, it, it sounds like whatever. I don't want to own music in a digital format exclusively ever. No. You know, I'd rather have a physical copy of it. But right. It's like now I don't have to be a, a scandalous fool and download stuff to know what it sounds like. It's just there now because at some point, I guess they... Because in this book with all these vinyl bootlegs and cassette bootlegs, all these companies were like constantly trying to find ways to figure out how to stop it. And it's like you got to put out the thing that the people want if you want to stop that otherwise they're gonna find a way to distribute it did you go to a cave and see a band oh you're talking about the caves in tennessee yeah that's, oh I, i've that heard was, about that, that lately was, there's a band sun they're the big drone band is that relate they, they, to they, this they, space opera rock whatever it is uh, not so much no not really no okay. no they're okay. they're more peripherally uh, uh into the the metal world okay because they play large heavy metal amplifiers and les pauls and stuff but they hit the note and they let it go as long as the feedback will let it go which is which comes from what it, a black sabbath a, a, undertaking ambient or... music but the opposite volume and any and, and yeah i mean sabbath it's there's sabbath and then there's the melvins melvins yeah and then the melvins made the first of those sort right. of drone metal albums and that's right. where all the bands that did that sort of kicked off from and the melvins are a great classic american band okay so what did you want to play next the feelies classic american rock and roll band i don't what you mean like you don't uh, you don't know the feelies everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey
Okay, what have you got to say for yourself, or for the feelies, for that matter? A great American TM band. Uh, I've, I've been exploring more of the world of, like, 80s American independent artists. The Hooskers and the Replacements and yeah. the Black Flags and the Feelies, the REMs of the world, you know, at least in their 80s. Like, all that, all that stuff economically... And socially is all still I have a totally theory. relevant. I have a theory. So a record store might make money off selling a Steely Dan record or uh, something that was pop, Boston, whatever. That's maybe how they make some money. But bands like yourself. Uh, no money. Garage bands or under, underground bands tend to be inspired by things which aren't very or never were popular. And that's fine. Which is the Velvet Underground model. As long as you're not... Yes, but it's expecting a, it, money. But it's also the death of rock and roll because the model begins to disap- the commercial model begins to disappear, and the underground model takes over. And the underground model was never a commercial model. I'm going to scoot around that assessment and say that Memphis also has an extremely wealthy uh, collection and list of underground rap over many, many, well, de- sure. many decades sure. that had no commercial ambition whatsoever. And now it's like people that exist on the internet would harm other people to be able to get a hold of some of the cassettes that are just like floating around like here. Like Project Pat. And, yeah, I mean, it's mm. stuff that was like floating around in the 90s yeah. and stuff. And, you know, you could go to a shop and buy it or whatever. It's impossible to find that stuff around anymore. But And, that, but, and that's culturally been like a huge shifter right. in the past. 10, 20 years because they're available online. And I mean, now most stuff is just like, this is our new album. It's out in two months. That's it. And then they go on tour or whatever and it's fine. But, and I mean, I don't have, I don't have anything to say for myself for my own stuff. It's just like part of my, it's the side quest of my life. Otherwise I got to work a stupid job Mm -hmm. eight to five or seven to four or whatever. And it's not like I can, most people don't have the luxury of being able to take, full time off and make being a crazy band their job. Scott Baxter and, did. Oh yeah, but now he works for the government. <laughs> <laughs> uh I don't I mean it's just the entire thing, everything, the industry and the culture is like not set up for like you know the, the classics of yore to be made all over. No, again. and like there's the, no and there's are, no reason the, for it to be. Everything moves on. Yeah, and rock, I, rock I, and roll progressed itself out of existence. It's like too much exposure on the internet means that there's no secrets anymore, mm-hmm. and there's there's no oddball anything. Like it's all that there's no hiding. You mystique. can't. There's no mystique. Uh, I mean, there's there's there of course there's stuff here and there. Have you, you seen know, my there. work? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, it rebukes the internet, I think. But there's like no room for good stories anymore. Everything is just sort of like, well, here's the next thing. And it's like, okay, exciting, fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'll listen to it and I'll give you some money for it if it's good. I'll go see your show if it's good. But there is no more North Louisiana's phenomenal pop combo. Who are these guys? Oh, it's Meet the Residents. Like that's okay. There's, so- there's not going to be a residence ever again. You can't pull that kind of stuff off now with the internet. This is how we try. started the evening, uh, talking, pulling a residence record that had uh, the Beatles' first album cover on it that they butchered. Not the butcher cover, but they butchered the art. Uh, why were you? Why did you pull the residence? Because it was on the shelf and it looks great. And I love it. Why do you love it? That's the Residents' because first I'm, album. Because they're Southern boys, and I'm a Southern boy, and I, I love Southern subversives and creatives. But I always heard the Residents were actually the Beatles. Is it because they used Beatle artwork and some dumbass said they were the Beatles? I don't I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I think the Beatles are way more as actual people and like the actual story. If you really read it and all the day by day and you watch the nine hours of the documentary, it's like these were just regular boring dudes, turns out. Uh, they weren't as... I mean... Every minute of their lives has been documented by now, mm-hmm. and you watch all nine hours of it, and it's like, wow, this is the Peter Jackson. This is this. I back. I love it personally, yeah. but it's yeah. like this is the tedious thing about being a human in a band. It's real boring when you know that's your only job and that's all you're expected to do is just make more music. It's like there's a lot of sitting around. There's a lot of farting. 
but, on people. There's a lot of just but, like humdrummery. I love the Ringo farting moment towards yeah. towards the end, and then Paul immediately wrote Long and Winding Road right after that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'll just say this, and this goes back to an earlier conversation we were having in the kitchen. If you wanted to go see a movie that had Clark Gable in it, or or Steve McQueen, you know, um, or you went to that movie, it didn't matter what genre it was. The Beatles are rock stars in such a phenomenal sense that it didn't really matter what kind of genre they recorded. You were only caring about what came out of John Lennon's mouth or Paul McCartney's mouth. And maybe that's not so true anymore of anything because the stardom aspect is dead. Everyone's too revealed. People, Who are some and, of the people and, that you like that right now are doing that, ridiculous that things? are gigantic? Yeah. Oh, I, I, on the spot, I can't even think of anybody. Every most of the newer stuff I like is all smaller, mid-sized kind of right uh, acting artistry. Because that speaks to a mystique. Not so much. That's just where they happen to be. It's not like general mass consumption sort of. But don't you think they uh, control their own image better that way, though? I mean, generally you do. If you're on a, if you're on like a smaller label or even a mid-sized label that is a fairly independent operation, yeah, they usually let those people have some control of what they do. If you're if you're on like a big label, then like that's purely a money making operation. There, there's <laughs> there's more handlers involved now, and there's like much more liability involved. But the beauty and, is, you think that they're one touch away from telling you what they really think on social media. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I think I think the whole mega artist on Twitter thing was a mistake. It's like, I don't want to know that much But are you saying it. that their immediacy is a facade? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's, I mean, it's it's not even them. It's it's a PR team or mm-hmm. the publicist or the handlers or whatever. I, right. I just, I don't, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm not trying to like knock it for other people because people like stuff. And I like stuff, sure. and I know there's plenty of people who would hate all the stuff that I like. So I try not to rag on people about it. You know what? But you can't get me to care about like the world of like m- most megastars. I don't sure, know. no, it's, well, it's just not no. interesting to me. Jesse, have we reached the end of our cycle? Maybe. How or is this it? Is this good night? Yeah, it's think, almost the so. bottom of the glass. Dennis, you have anything else to uh, throw in, or we may not have played all the songs you brought. I don't know. They just didn't come up in conversation. Maybe. Or... What else is on the list? You want to go out yeah, on a soon a song let's that pick one to take uh, take us out on. Yeah, we've got uh, well, we never played the Beach Boys. Which we which we the, never which, played the Beach which Boys. Which Beach Boys is it? Don't go near the water. Don't go near the water. That's from Surf's Up. Set it up. That's that's a great one because it's like the the band is called the Beach Boys and all their early stuff is the beach and surfing and the cars and the girls, and then ten years later the album is called Surf's Up and then the, the cover is like. The, the, In, the the native, native on the yeah, horse yeah. and it's you can barely see the cover because it's so dark and gloomy so, and the first song is called don't go near the water <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's now they're you know their their new manager is trying to get them to be unsquare and he's trying to get them into the counter culture of the times and the first song is like an environmental awareness song and don't go near the water which features what i'm pretty sure is a moog synthesizer uh <laughs> Which they probably got from the Monterey Pop Festival. Why do you bring? Why do you say that? Because, <laughs> because <laughs> at the Monterey Pop Festival, outside of all the music, there were a bunch of vendor stalls, and one of them was for this brand new company called Moog. And I can't remember. I think they were based in New York at the time. It was Robert Moog, and he was making all these synthesizers, and he just had all these to try out. And it was there that I think the Beach Boys bought one. I know. I think the Monkees bought one. And it's there's one on the Star Collector on Pisces, Capricorn, Aquarius, or whatever in '67, and then Roger McGuinn definitely bought one because there's one all over Notorious Bird Brothers. Uh, wait a second. So you're saying but that they all, I think they all got them from there. At that's that. not the story I thought you were going to tell me about What's the Monterey the, Pop. Well, it's the actual story. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me the story about how the Beach Boys couldn't get it together that, to play I mean, the Monterey Yeah, yeah, they, they couldn't, but they could go buy stuff. Yeah. Brian was worried people were going to laugh at the way they were dressed. Well, they weren't wearing striped shirts at that point. Uh, at, at 65, 66, they still were. Well, had they no control over their striped shirts? They were squares. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. The Monterey Pop Festival, you're talking about 67? Yeah. With one, Hendrix. One year after striped shirts, they, they would have probably still been wearing their striped shirts unless they decided to change it all up. 
It's anxiety to add to the equation. Don't the girlfriends help them? Like the girlfriends help the stones? <laughs> I don't know. The, I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the girlfriends have the I mean, stones the, the, wearing their the, clothes. I don't think the stones were ever square dudes, even from day one. Well, that's because they listen to their girlfriends. Yeah, maybe. Um, How does capital determine out of numerous versions of bootlegs what might comprise a box set of a 50th anniversary uh, smile well they they did one a while back in 2012 2011 or so mm-hmm. and it was i think five discs and that's five a, discs. a few hours you know yeah. and it's like people there's there's like a hundred hours of just good vibrations Mm-hmm. recording sessions <laughs> and there's about a hundred hours of heroes and villains right and then there's no telling how much for the rest of the record so it this is a a thing that happens over and over again where the the company that has always owned this stuff finally says oh you know what we'll give them the thing finally and then in typical large corporate um, reaching for profits fashion. What do you mean the company? You mean capital says we'll give who? Yeah, yeah, whoever or whoever owns all the stuff finally decides to put it out. They do it in a way that is like shortchanging the people who know better, who know, mm. you know, who have been collecting the stuff forever. They they know better, and they know that this is not the good stuff, or you know, the full story, or the best source for the show, or whatever. They're, Fans are always going to be smarter than the record labels that are just trying to make, you know, because ultimately profits the goal. And that's not a great way of making art. So you didn't like the smile box set? No, I mean, I loved it. You loved it? it? Because it sounds great and it's got a lot of good stuff on it. But I, as somebody who's interested in bootlegs, knows that there's a whole lot more. But people don't buy stuff like that. When, you know, nobody except for a handful people who can afford it are going to buy a 200 CD, you know, box set or something. It, it's, that's a, that's a real, it's, it's, it's tough <laughs> to get people to actually pay for that. It's, it's hard to manufacture that stuff like that. Dennis, would you pay um, $800 for a 100 CD set of beach boy outtakes smile sessions? I would have to listen to it first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could, you could, you could steal it first and then you could check it out. Um, it rented out the library. Yeah. Uh, oh, what were we talking about? Well, I'd, well, I mean, we can talk about the Beach Boys some because I know that's our favorite band. Collectively, probably, yeah. Yeah. You turned me on to um, Dennis Wilson's Pacific Ocean Blue. You didn't hear that before I told you about it? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. You know who else hasn't heard it? Brian Wilson. He says he hasn't. Well, there you go. But he doesn't remember things very well anyway. He's not a reliable narrator. Brian, I thought Brian helped on Pacific Ocean. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's always told people, you know. He doesn't want any credit. No, nah, he, he's probably just sad that his brother died. Sure. He doesn't want to listen to it. No, it's, no I, I love that record. Yeah. Den, Dennis has, as the Beach Boys have been putting out these big box sets of stuff, a, a, a lot of which has never been bootlegged before at all. Nobody's ever mm-hmm. heard because they've got a giganto tape vault, and I think they've kept a pretty good handle on, especially with the '70s stuff that nobody really cared about. Until. Brother, Brother Records is still owned by the children. Uh, I think I think it's still owned by all the the boys. They're it all, wasn't owned by all, Capital at that point. No, that was Warner. Oh. Warner and Reprise. They uh, they they had Brother Records. But do you think they, if, they've been putting out a bunch of actually unreleased stuff and. There's a lot, a lot of Dennis solo. Yeah. Didn't make the cut stuff that's great. You mean stuff that wasn't even on bamboo or, or no, would have been no, on bamboo? No, 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 or singles or anything like that. No, this is like early 70s stuff. Huh. Like when he was first starting to write songs, they just cut all of his stuff from the records. Right. Because most of it was probably a little too moody and sad. And well, I think that's Solo the... piano to be Beach Boys material at the time. Do you think that makes Dennis the most interesting Beach Boy? I think so. Between, I mean, his music is not reflective of his public personality mm, whatsoever. Yeah, lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit, but not. I think all. it's the accumulated lifestyle that makes his music introspective. Yeah. Whereas Dennis, or well, Carl, maybe you don't get that. Carl, Carl's there to keep it together and make sure everything keeps going. He doesn't have right. time to stop and. Make, right. make things for himself. So what's your what's your overview of 
I, I, well, there are different periods, I suppose, of the Beach Boys, like there would be the Beatles or anyone else, but except the Beach Boys kept going. What's your favorite periods or favorite albums or the offshoots like Carl and the Passions and things like that? The early 70s stuff. Yeah. The run from Sunflower, Surf's Up, Carl and the Passions, and Holland. And, Holland. Then, and then the live, uh, the live concert from 73, which again... People who know better and have heard soundboard tapes and radio broadcasts say that that's a poorly assembled live album, and there's much, much better stuff out there. And once again, we hit the 50th anniversary, and the company that's trying to maximize profits didn't put out anything for it for its 50th anniversary. It's just sort of huh. didn't happen. So it's just there. <clears throat> it's a good live album. I like it, but it's a little uneven. But that's my favorite stuff is when they augment the band with the two guys ricky and blondie from the flame mm-hmm. and sort of beef up the rhythm section but is this no brian in the live picture but it's still right. really great but is it is it kind of a nostalgia show at that point not quite uh, not quite they i guess they hit 74 and Capitol records who owned all the old stuff they put out endless summer which is Mm, here's yeah. what here's what you guys want the band to be which is the oldies band and that that was the, the mike of, love uh, yeah generation. that was the year he mike got his way and that's when they kind of turned it into an oldies band endless summer though is uh it's, it's great <sighs> yeah but it's not what they were doing at the time at all and that kind of blew the steam out of whatever they were trying to do i think um american graffiti had a huge impact on what would you know eventually same year isn't it Yes, 73 into 74. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course, burgeoning into Happy Days. And um, I think that probably gave Elvis and a lot of those rockers a lot of a second wind it, it, as far as to get through the 70s. Uh, and so many of those people were still alive. Yeah. But um, is this the album you're talking about that has Dennis on the cover with a broken arm broken arm and he's extending the microphone out over the crowd and it's right. at an odd angle and it's red and it looks evil and because he supposedly wrote the song uh the big hit that ceased to exist <laughs> the manson song not the manson song not the manson song. uh no the love song um you're everything i hope for you're everything I... oh you uh, are, so, you are beautiful. so beautiful yeah yeah he, he he ghost wrote it i think he ghost wrote it that's massive. That's with like a carpenter Joe Cocker? Song. With Joe Cocker. I mean, that's as big as like a Elton John tune, or, or it could have been. I mean, yeah. Maybe he, it... he would come out and sing it solo every now and then with sweat all over him. And yeah. Sweaty towel. Yeah, the, the toxins. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah big time. <laughs> Sweating them out. Or you meant, Getting you didn't, healthy. You didn't mention 2020 in the album list. Those are, that one's in the 60s. That's ah. the last Capital one. I love that record, too. I mean, I love all the late 60s ones. That's kind of how, that's how I got yeah. into all of it big time. Um, I mean, I had heard, like, Pet Sounds before, but yeah. hearing that run from, like, Smiley Smile through Wild Honey Friends 2020, or uh, that's... I, I love all those records too and they're all 23 minutes or something mm-hmm. which is how long I think every album right. should be and right I know. well thanks for talking um, to us and, yeah. I, and I can't wait to hear Don't Go Near the Water see it all goes back to the Beach Boys it eventually. does I love talking to you about the Beach Boys roll it Dennis <laughs> Don't go near the water Don't you think it's sad What's happened to the water Our water's going bad Oceans, rivers, lakes and streams Have all been touched by me
message of this song. Thanks for listening to the Black and Wyatt Records podcast. Today featuring Jesse Mansfield, interviewed by Mike McCarthy. Watch for the upcoming Jesse Mansfield mini documentary by Mike McCarthy on the Black and Wyatt Records YouTube channel. And don't forget to check out our website, blackandwyattrecords.com, to learn more about our vinyl releases and to purchase records. Join us next time for the Black and White Records podcast.